Oh, what up, YouTube? Oh, what up, YouTube? <laughs> Julian <laughs> brings it in, as usual. <laughs> Here we go. All right, the live green light is on. Green light. Who's on the screen right now? Uh, currently, it is my screen. Okay. Do you want me to hop it to you? No, wait, I mean, it's okay. You can start it off. No, I'm not doing anything. Sure. I just needed like a, a, a plain thing to put on here. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can get the... I'm going to hop to you now. Let's okay. Let's get the uh, Discord well, this screen. this is my screen. Uh, so the last video we put out wait, was well, about... Is there anybody even on yet? What? Of course, Mark Draws is right in here. Like, let's break stuff. Immediate quality. He knows what's, he knows what, he knows what's going on. Uh, so the last <laughs> video we put out was about Welcome, uh, Mark. the release of Ghidra. Um, we kind of went through a really simple uh, buffer overflow challenge that I created. Uh, one of the questions we got from one of the comments was, how would I do this without a win function? So my last, uh, my last example um, was a simple overflow... And I can actually show you real quick the actual original C code from it. Um, and it had this little helpful win function that would cat a file called flag.txt. A very CTF-esque uh, solution to a problem is if you can control EIP and return to some special function, you can get the flag. Um, it's not it's not necessarily very real-world-esque, but it is very CTF-esque, and you'll see that a lot in these pwn challenges. One of the questions someone asked were, was, um, how would I do this without the... Um, win function um, that's an interesting question it kind of depends on the, the, the actual application itself um, that specific version of it there wasn't any memory leaks or anything like that so I didn't really see a really easy or good way to explain how to do that so I actually created a different um, binary or a different challenge for this one um, we'll kind of go through that and this one is exploitable it has no win function where our goal is to get a shell um, and be able to to get code execution on that through that binary I should say it's not remote for me, but it is through that binary. Um, so it's a very similar application. Um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about anything else, John, before we got started. But No, uh, <laughs> I'm failing to mention this in the Discord server, so I'll try and get it, uh -oh. get it rolling. I forget, like, how to use the, the bot consistently. <laughs> Where's Cave? Yeah, <laughs> where's, where's Cave? Can you wait your, your trusty little guys from your Discord to just do it? Justin Wagner, thanks for coming to hang out. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed uh, playing CCDC. We did play a little bit of that today, which was a blast. So hopefully we'll cover that very soon. Are you diving in, Caleb? I mean, I can whenever you're ready. Yeah, dude. We're I, just, uh, you're running the show, and I'm here to cool. be here. <laughs> cool. So um, I think last time we kind of quickly went over the source code just for awareness um, as we're going through this uh, kind of glimpse behind the curtain, I guess you could say, um, of what we're doing. So normally you wouldn't have the source code. I'm just going to kind of run through it real quick so we have an idea so this doesn't take as long to kind of figure out what's going on, although I don't think it's incredibly complicated. Um, for anybody that saw the last video... Uh, this application is very similar. This, this binary is very similar to the last one. Um, it's still kind of an authentication portal, uh, fake authentication portal. Um, the only options are to register and to log in. Register will overwrite your current credentials and log in will verify whatever you give it. Um, and in this case, um, instead of you typing in, in the old one, uh, when you actually ran the binary itself, um, it would ask you run it real quick it would add, you could say help whatever commands there are you'd run register and it would ask you for your individual username and your password um, and you could log in or ask you the same whoops you could log in or ask you the same type of things um, and so that's how the old one worked in the new one um, what we're actually doing instead is it will you can type the commands in but you give the uh, username and password as options or as parameters to those commands so you might say register um, Caleb is my name and then some password for a password and then you can log in with Caleb and password um, It's great. The passwords are echoed to the console. It's, it's pretty great. Um, it's great. It's quality authentication portal. Really, I would put this straight to production right now. <laughs> um, no, I also added uh, some help descriptions for the different commands. Um, just some, some little fancy things that look a little different. Um, the big thing is just the way the commands are actually run. So you'll see that in the source code, um, the actual command functions, whereas last time uh, had no parameters, now have a character pointer argument or a string. Um, and then that's really the only difference. The, the main function itself will do a little bit of string processing to be able to pass those parameters to you. Um, and that's, the, that's really the only difference between this and the last one. Um, and so with that, we'll go ahead and hop over to Ghidra. I have just opened Ghidra, um, and we kind of went through the startup of Ghidra in our last video, but for those that didn't see it or haven't seen it yet or whatever, You'll end up with a screen like this initially. You'll create a new project. Um, and then once you open the project, or once you create the project, you can click this little button right here and you'll get to actually the code browser where you can import a binary with the import file and you'll end up with 
click through a couple windows for analyzing it, um, and you'll end up here with all of the the juiciness right in front of you. Um, so this is, a, this is a fun I, uh, is it Can the you fire one? up is some juice? Is that a technical term? I, I think it is. We're men of science I think it's here. In, I think it's in the manual for What did you say, this John? The, I said we're men of science. <laughs> this is the juicy window. If you look it up in the manual, this is the juicy window. Um, Can you get up for that, too? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so. Words are hard. I know. I just That's choking fine. on my words. So. Looking at it in Ghidra, um, again, like we talked about before, Ghidra's decompiler is awesome. Um, it does a lot of great things. And one cool thing that I kind of wanted to talk about here, a change I made in this in this new version of this challenge was to put before the command name and the command function were in two different arrays, one an array of function pointers and one an array of strings. Um, this time I kind of combined that all together with one other field uh, called an help field, which showed you uh, which showed you like kind of a little help on it that you'll see whenever you run the help command. Um, and I combine them all into a little structure, um, just kind of show off a thing that I found in Ghidra that I had completely forgotten about, um, which is you can actually define arbitrary types inside of Ghidra to help you do your analysis. Um, so when you're looking at this main function here, you'll see, we'd seen the code briefly, um, but it, it does a really good job of this loop. Um, we've got a, this kind of converts this to a do while loop, and you see that's a do while true, so this looks like our main loop inside of our function. Um, and it's reading in a string as long as uh, the string does not is not empty, basically. So it keeps dumping you to a prompt, which is similar to what we saw last time. We can see that again here. Um, I, I like to keep, unless it's something I think might be malicious, I like to keep it running in the background and just as I'm looking at the disassembly or the decompilation, be like, oh, I think this is what it's doing. Let me test that real quick. Okay, so, I mean, you enter, hit enter a bunch of times, and you're just getting the same prompt again. So that looks like what we're getting right here. Um, the read string ha function hasn't changed. I'm not going to go through that last time. From last time, doing the same thing, reading in a string, truncating off or uh, trimming off the new line character from the string, and then returning uh, the size of the string itself that was read in. So we see that reading the prompt, um, and then down here where we actually look for the command itself is where it has changed a little bit. Uh, or actually, I should say right here, um, we use strtok which is to tokenize the string. So we see the first call um, to read string, we read in the string into this local 418. There's a lot bigger uh, stack variables here. We see that that is a 1032 byte uh, character array or 1032 character length string. Um, and we read in up to 1024 characters into that string. So we read in this really long string here. Um, and then we use SDRTOK to tokenize the string based on spaces. So we grab the first token before a space character. Um, and that's gonna be saved in this variable called S2 that Ghidra named S2. Um, it then runs another SDRTOK. Uh, you see it has a null byte in, or a null pointer in. Uh, if you've ever used, if you're UC at all, SDRTOK, the first time you call it, you give it the string pointer and the uh, delimiters you wanna delimit it on. And then the sec and successive calls to that, you give it a null string, it will give you the next uh, token. And then after that, we tell it that the new uh, delimiters, we don't have any delimiters. In other words, that's gonna make strtok return the rest of the string. So you basically split it on the first space. We have everything before the first space and everything after the first space. So then we go into this similar for loop like we saw in the last example, where we iterate from zero to uh, three, zero, three, the four different commands. Um, and we're gonna do a similar strcmp, so the str compare, um, except this time we're seeing it indexing this commands global variable that wasn't there last time with the iterator and then an index of eight. Can I pause you for a quick second? Sure. Uh, someone asked, and you might have a little more to weigh in on this than I would, but he asked, does this tool offer any significant advantages over the free version of IDA? More so support yes. for different architectures. Yeah. So yeah. the free version of IDA only allows you to look at uh, I believe it's only x86. I know it's only 32 32-bit for sure, yeah. Um, I believe it's only x86, and it has no decompiler. So the free version of IDA just kind of dips your toes in the water mm -hmm. um, and makes you want to shell out your arm and leg for something really nice. Um, whereas <laughs> Glad you kinda... used my words. <laughs> yeah. was like, that was my exact quote. So, uh, so this kind of gives you everything. So it has support. I don't even know the whole list of architectures yeah. it supports, um, but it supports. We've just been throwing thing. everything at it, and it seems to be catching it pretty well. Yeah, it, it seems to do a really good job of kind of figuring stuff out for you. Um, and then it also has this really nice decompiler, which I think is one of the things that sets it apart from other um, reverse engineering tools that are free that are out there, um, is this fantastic decompiler, which is a really hard job to do that it does yeah. really well. Um, 
Does that I hope that answers the question? Yeah. Is that uh, is there is that close to what you were thinking of? It's just awesome, dude. Yeah, of I, course. I like hype bandwagon. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So as I was saying, we we index this commands global variable with our index um, by a size of eighteen. So basically, what this is doing is it's saying I have a variable called commands. I don't know what type it is, but I'm gonna go the index vr that number <laughs> that number of sets of eight of uh, eighteen hex bytes. I don't really have. Yeah. Kind of an awkward way to don't say know how that. to say those words. Um, words are hard. English is hard. It was my first language. I still don't do it very well. <laughs> um, What's up, Gabe? <laughs> Wait, hold on. I never wear a hat. What? Cave, Cave Venom, seven? our favorite moderator, just uh, came onto the stream. Is like, dude, everyone's everyone's right in their in their natural environment. Caleb is flexing his accent. Am I? Do I have an accent? <laughs> Do you have an accent? I didn't know I had an accent. No. Uh, so in any case, soul what this is looks here. Like, Welcome. Yeah, keep going, man. No, you're fine. You're fine. Drive. What this looks like is you're indexing an array of some kind of structure, and each item is 18 hex long. And then this specific item that we're looking for is eight bytes into that structure. Um, so it looks like we have some sort of data structure, structure we call a struct in C, something like that, and we're not really sure what it is yet. Judging by the context here, it looks like whatever the structure is, at an eight byte offset, we have the name of the command. Just because we kind of know that's what's going on here in the main function, it's looking for co the correct command. Um, and so that if, it equals zero, which again is a successful or a uh, true compare. They are equal. Um, then it actually references that same structure with an offset of zero and executes it. So what that looks like is whatever that structure is, at an offset of zero, we have a function pointer. Oh. At an offset of eight, which we have up here, an offset of eight, we have the name of the actual command itself. So that's what it looks like to me. So one really cool thing that I liked a lot about Ghidra that I had forgotten about is you can come over here to this type manager in the bottom left, which is down here on the left by default. Um, and you can actually right click on just like your binary itself and you can click new and structure. So it's gonna pop up this little window and we're just gonna give it a type. We're gonna call it uh, command. Can you run that by me one more time? I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. Yeah. The bottom left of your Ghidra window, there's gonna be a data type manager. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And if you right click on, you can right click on any of these. I believe you can add it to anything. I usually add it to the mm. chat to the actual binary you're looking at. So I'll right click on this case on challenge, which is the name of the binary I open, mm -hmm. and go to new and then structure because we know we're looking for some sort of structured data type. Um, here, I didn't mean to type that into search. I meant to type that in a name. Um, you can just name it whatever you want. I'm going to name it command underscore t, um, just because it looks like it says commands is the name of the variable. Yeah. Some sort of command structure. The two things we know that are there right now, which we've seen, are a um, a function pointer, which there's no direct type for a function pointer, but what you can do is just type pointer 64, and so that will be a 64-bit pointer of some type, and I'm just gonna call it function, or maybe func or something like that, I don't know. Um, and then the next thing we know at offset eight, which if the first thing is a 64-bit pointer, at offset eight would be the next item, uh, we know is another pointer to the name itself. So it's a character pointer. So we'll throw that in there. We'll just call it name. Right now, that's all we know of it. We know that it actually is longer, but we don't know what those other items are yet. So we'll just kind of leave that for now. We'll keep that in the back of our mind. We'll save that. Um, what we could do, what we could do right now actually is just add the other things as 64-bit types. So we just add pointer 64. We don't know what it is. Be like unknown zero and because we know how big it's supposed to be because of that 18 hex um and we can go okay uh, actually i think that's all of it oops how do i move that where's the move button it's like the uh, eraser sorry? yeah i see c or the eraser looks like it'll clear it there's a little x oh there it is yeah. yeah yeah so we know there's another item there we don't know what it is yet um because we know it says 18 hex so that's going to be 24 bytes so we add one more eight byte Thing into this structure we see the size is now 24 so that's the right size we just don't know what that last eight bytes actually are yet mm -hmm. we can go ahead and save that and now whenever you go in here oh, oops cancel didn't want that uh whenever you go here to the commands you can actually double click on pans commands go to where it is in memory and we did this similar type of thing before where we defined an array of string pointers or something like that um but here now that we've created that data type we can just right click on commands yeah and then go to choose data type. 
and we can browse again and go to challenge and under search under challenge or under your you binary command name, T. You have command T now. And Heck in this yeah. case, we don't just want command T. It's going to be an array, which if before we actually do this, we go over here and look at how big it is. It should tell us. It's being rude. Um, so it says 96 elements of undefined one. So undefined one is a one byte type so there's uh, so it's an array of 96 bytes is all it knows right now mm -hmm. so for us um on the spot math problematic people um, we can go in here and say 96 divided by 24 which we know is the size of the structure that means there must be four of them in that array um based on the analysis that Hedra did it's not necessarily guaranteed but that is pretty likely um so we can go back in here to the set data or choose data type and say that we want it to be a command underscore t and we want it to be an array of four of them so whenever we do that, we should see it change in here. It'll say that it knows what type it is. If you hover over here, there's the base data type is a structure command. And it gives you like the, the layout of it there. And it says there's length, there's 24, and the size of this entire block is 96 still. Can you give me that one more time? I went ahead and tried to like change the commands to choose data type, and then I put in command T. Okay, Should so if you I... just hit Command T, then yep. it's gonna think it's just one of them. Yeah. The way you do that is you go to choose data type again, and you just put open brace or, or open square brace, the number of items you know that are in that array, and then close square brace. And we know that there were four. We found the four because if you look at the size, so if you hover right down here on before you do this, it'll say unknown right here. Right. Yeah. That's so what. If you hover there, it'll say size of ninety six, um, and then if you're uh, bad at math on the spot you can just go 96 <laughs> divided by what we know the structure size is just 24 yeah and you'll get four so you know there's four of them there let me do that let me do that i just want to do that math to see it happen 96 yeah, sure, divided sure. by four classic four man <laughs> that's crazy how that stuff works it's, it's weird how math is the same no matter what computer you do it i don't get it unless you're an old pentium in which case i run four. docker what? I what? use Docker, so uh, the way that math will work on my machine will be the work the way the math works on your machine. Oh, good, good. I'm happy. That's what Docker does. Um, unless, <laughs> so fun fact: there was an old Pentium processor where yeah, the twenty yeah. point unit was messed up, and two times two was actually rounded to five. <laughs> fun fact. Um, I had a conversation I hope somebody, with someone. Nobody asked me which exact processor it was because I don't remember. It's just a fun fact I've had in the back of my head for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I had someone ask me why one times one isn't two when one plus one is two. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to let you have this one. <laughs> I don't I'm not understand gonna... the question. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Um, so back to what we were talking about. The really cool thing about being able to do that is coming back to our main function. And Ghidra yeah. has updated the decompilation. And since we defined it as an array, it now has the normal syntax in C for an array with the square bra braces. Oh! Also, it shows you, instead of adding 8 and dereferencing it, it shows you, hey, we're actually referencing dot, dot name, name. That's super nice. And dot func. So it's really easy and really nice to be able to see all of a sudden, oh, that offset by 24 bytes or whatever, maybe in a more complicated structure, by 136 bytes, yeah. is actually this thing. Um, so it's really useful. If you don't know the structure, you can kind of start building it out. And if you do know the structure, it makes it a lot easier to look at because you can throw it in there really at the very beginning and all of a sudden have your decompilation look bounds better, um, much easier to read. So um, that's really all there is to the main function. It just goes through and calls these individual functions. Just like before, there's not really a lot to look at here. Um, keep in mind the way that we split up this string and then the fact that we're passing in everything after the space into the function yeah so keep that in mind as we go to look at the other functions okay but from here we can kind of move we can on. get to it yeah um so again as before i don't think i've changed the quit function at all uh still does some cheesy clearing out of your username and password um and then the help function simply prints out uh it will print out your name did your help function clearly come through yes what? did you were you not able to see that? no I, I so i got an address maybe i need to expand this Oh, oh, are you trying to look at it in the array? Uh, so I just I think went to so. the function list. Let me see what it looks like Ooh. if I actually go to the commands array. I don't know. Yeah, because now we actually have the functions as real functions, right? You can find them in the commands array, though. If you expand each of these, mm -hmm. it is there. I'm not taking off my hat. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's calling for using your hat. So I see me. do Unless quit Ava asks me. S, etc. So my command T is there. My command T is not, like, expanding hmm. as I think it should. Up to me. That's weird. 
Maybe uh. And you set it to an array of four. I had what one. Are your set data type again? This I appear. Yeah, yeah. Choose data type. Can they see your screen? Grant your four. Yep, you're on me. Cool, cool. Hmm. Maybe. Another guy was right. That's weird. So if you go back to my screen, I can show you what it looks like on mine and what I would should expect look. it to look like yeah. on yours. So on mine, you have this little expanding. Are we back on me? Yes, we are back okay, on cool. you. Um, so you have this little expanding right oh. here. You can actually oh. collapse the whole entire there thing. There it is. If you expand it, you can then expand each of the individual I, items yeah. as well. I found it. It was kind of hiding on me. I think my scroll bar was just a little too far out, but now it has figured uh, out the okay. names of these functions. Gotcha. So, so you can actually... If you didn't know the names of the functions, like John was saying, you could go back into this global command array and see the actual function pointers here um, under the func. It'll say func off of the next, or whatever you named it. I named it func. Um, it'll say func, and then the name of the, it'll resolve that symbol um, to whatever it is. Very uh, cool. So. Jules is tapping out. I need this water. <laughs> Sweet, man. So like I said, quit hadn't really changed. Uh, if we look at help, It'll actually show us what the last thing we didn't know what it was. We can see it references dot unknown zero, which is what I named that last variable in the structure. I didn't know what it was. Um, so it looks like it prints out the name of the command, a dash, and then something else in unknown zero. Oh, Presumably, fun. it looks like it's talking about a help string. Yeah. Like um, what? Yeah. So that's so as I said before, you can also kind of come in here and be like, oh, what is help printing out? Oh, those are help strings. Okay. So then you go back to the uh, Ghidra itself, and you can see, oh, cool. So unknown zero must be a help string. And it actually, it's it will like continuously fix your stuff as you change these things. So you can go back into your type editor on the left, bottom left, double click on command T, change that name to like help, and then click, make sure you click the little save button at the top. Nice. And then it will actually change all those references to dot help. Nice. So that's really useful. It's really nice to look at. Um, do help doesn't really do anything else as just like in the last one. So now we're on to the register function, which is like in a lot, uh, similar to the last one, this is where some of the um, juiciness again happens. Yeah, um, all, about that, <laughs> all about that juicy. Uh, so <laughs> I'll need to stop that right now. I can't, I can't stop it. It's Julian took the hat off. Oh my God, you Armageddon. succumb, you succumb Apocalypse. to their peer pressure. Oh, well, it was How actually you... Devin's peer pressure. Devin, is Devin on the Oh peer no. He is. What a guy. Hey, welcome. Um, What's his name? Where's he lurking at? I don't know. He texted me a <laughs> screenshot and was saying rednecks do the cyber. <laughs> hey, man. I do things. There was a comment, uh, and I'm not saying this as to, to point it out, but I, as, as, a, as a labor of love, that said, how come all these hackers are just wearing hoodies and, and hats? Is that just what they do? I'm wearing no hoodie. Yeah. This is not a You hoodie. got the hat on, though. I have a hat. There is a hat. My hat has a hat. Can you go Gabe, one you, stream without you, making a terrible A sex? single one. <laughs> without what? Can you go on one stream, a single solitary stream, without making a terrible sex joke? Well, I'm going to make a terrible sex joke. I don't remember it happening. Um, anyways, back to register. Chilling in register right now. Um, as I said, everything after the space in the first command, what we saw from main, gets passed directly into the register function or any of the other functions. Um, and what we see in the actual, when we actually run it, if we type register, it'll say, hey, I want username and then a space and then the password. So we can see that right here. If the parameter is null, which means we didn't give it any parameters, um, then it will say, hey, what the hell? I want this other stuff. Please send it to me. Um, so if it isn't null, then it's going to use similar method to the main function. It's going to use strtok again to split it by the next space. So it's going to grab the, everything before the first space, again, in, in all your parameters um, as the username and everything after as the password. Um, and just like we talked about in the last video, you can go in here and rename these, pa these variables. So we could say it's going to be a username, and we're going to say this is going to be a password. Um, and so then now we kind of get that flow down. Hey, if, if there was no password, um, it's going to print the usage again. Um, and print another little message with no password specified. And again, we can go back and, and double check what we're seeing here by saying I'm going to register a user with no password. That's interesting. I actually have no clue why that happened. Um, just, you know, no idea. That's all right. That's fine. We'll try that again later. Next video. Um, <laughs> it's a whole different vulnerability I didn't even plan for. Uh, oh, I see why. There's no return statement there. Anyways. Mm. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, if you did enter a username and a password, then it's going to copy your, user, your username you entered 
to the global username function. It has a um, length delimiter, again, with 40. So it's going to be 64, right? Yeah, yep. 64. Um, which we can go back to this global username again, and we can see, hey, how long is this? Hedra's like, hey, I'm pretty sure that's 64 bytes. Okay, cool. So that makes sense. We're copying the string maximum of 64 uh, in length. That's fine. Here, we see a similar uh, action to the last one. Um, it's going to go through and look at the password, and it's going to load the password in XOR with the key. Um, and this is actually going to be... Um, goodness. So this is going to be up to 64 bytes as well. If I recall correctly. I might miss one point. We could check the source, see if I think it was that. Source, just, to, just to get a little verify, it. yeah. Just to, you know, just double check things. We can see this, the key in here, can't we? Do what? We can see the key in here. Yeah. Um, I just like to double check, you know, when no, I, I agree. read something, and then I'm like, wait, what did I do again? I'm like, where was that? Don't store passwords in plain text. The key should be 64. 64 bytes. At it least is 64 here. bytes. So... Um, Double whammy. Oh, that's why, because I did, did the comparison on both. You got the source, I got the disassembly. 64 Ooh. bytes. Woo. Yes. Teamwork. You always got to double check yourself, you know? Triple check. Game. Triple check. Quad. Cool. <laughs> so, um, it does a similar thing where we get that overflow right there. So, this really hasn't changed much. The only difference here is that you're getting a parameter into the function itself, and then we're still, we still have that 64 bytes, which if we go back to the global password function... Just like last time, Hedra says, hey, wait, no, I'm pretty sure that's 32 bytes. So what we're seeing here is we can still put 64 bytes into a 32-byte buffer um, at global password. Those are XORed with a key, so we still have to make sure that we are XORing them with whatever that key is, which we actually can see the key in memory. Yeah. Um, again, similar type of thing. We can see the key. We can change the type to a, a character pointer if we wanted to see it a little nicer, but it's the same as, it's the same as last time. Um, so, question. This might be me jumping the gun, but can Pwn Tools recognize that key? Just pull it out? Yes. So, I don't know if we really talked about it last time. I don't know if we did. Um, I remember we got it some way. So, it does work in Pwn Tools to be able yeah. to pull it out. So, if, if you've never used Pwn Tools, please look it up. It's fantastic. Really useful. We use it all the time. I, do, I literally use it for almost everything I do in Python ever. Um, even when it's not even an exploitation thing. It just has some really useful stuff. Pwn.log is just gorgeous. It really is. Yeah. And then the process, or the, the progress. Oh, anyways, I digress. It has an elf module where you can give it a binary, and it will load it in, and it won't run the, it won't run the binary. It will just load it in, read the symbols, give you access to everything to find in it. You can access the sections, the symbol table, the, uh, the constant memory within it. Um, and so what it can actually do is a really useful thing called the elf.string method. Um, which you give elf.string an address within the process, and then it will say, okay, cool, I'm going to look for a null terminated string at that address, and it will just return that string. So in our case, we know that there is a symbol called key, which we saw in Ghidra right here, um, and that symbol is a, is this below? Okay, 64, it's a 64 byte array of some kind of key. Um, if we actually look in here, we scroll to the end of it there is a null byte if i recall correctly at the end of it did you say it was strings i tried to i tried to hop over to me string string yes yeah, no, no s so it's to extract a string there's yeah. other ones called uh i think there's u32 i think u32 will extract a unsigned 32-bit integer um there's like q nice. will extract a 64-bit integer yeah yeah um, that kind of thing. there's a lot of different ones that are really useful um i think just n will extract a certain number of bytes at an address if you wanted to do it that way. So if the thing you were extracting wasn't an terminated string, you could use n to extract those bytes. Um, so that's super useful, because I'll use that in the actual solution, which is what I have open now, to do the XOR, and I don't have to go through the hassle of coming in here and trying to get all these individual, well, all of these individual bytes out to do the XOR. I can just let Pwn Tools do it for me. Sweet. So, as I said, this function hasn't changed a lot, with the exception of the the actual buffer that we're operating on is actually on the stack of the main function. And we have those parameters specified to the function itself. So in a similar way to last time, we can still overwrite, if we look at the end of the password buffer, if I click right here, so we've got this password buffer, we collapse that, right after the password buffer, we still have the commands array. And if we look inside of the commands, 
the first thing in the commands array is the actual function pointer. So we can still write a function pointer just like we did before, but we can do something a little bit more too. This time we have control over the parameter to that function by using the actual, um, what's the word we're looking for? The parameters following the space from the main function. So as kind of an example of that, I can take this solution I have here, and here, what we basically do is very similar to the last one, um, except we didn't we use a different symbol. We overflow the first 32 bytes, which is the actual buffer of the password. So that's these 32 bytes from the buffer here. And then after that, we send, we, we pack 64 as a function inside of uh, Pwn Tools as well, which will take a number and pack it into a string of bytes. Um, we take the first four bytes of that because there's a better way to do this actually. I should have just, it's really just um, r strip zero. Um, it's just stripping off the null bytes so that it doesn't um, send null bytes because that makes some weird things happen. Um, so basically we take the, the 32As which fills up the password buffer and then we send the address of the printf function in the PLT, the procedure linkage, linkage, linkage table? Procedure Procedural linkage, linkage table, table, I think. Yeah. Oh, words. Um, XOR that with the key and so that should happen right in here when we register. It'll overflow the password and overflow into the command array, and it should overwrite the do quit command with the address of printf. The difference between this and the last example we had was that now whatever we write after quit will be passed directly to printf. So we can see that in an example if we actually just run p.interactive here. Um, and then we can go over here and actually just run solution. And so now we're at this little prompt. You see the little, um, what's a sideways carrot? Greater than sign, there it is. <laughs> sideways carrot. Uh, you see the little greater than sign for the prompt from- I like to call them waka wakas. Waka 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 waka. It's like a little Pac-Man noise. He's right. I can see that. He's right. I hate it when he is, but he's right this time. Um, so here, now what we can actually do is we can say, hey, I want to print some stuff. Oh, whoops. I want to print, um, I want to print, so the pointer to the quit function now points to printf. And so it, whatever parameters I give to quit will be sent to printf. So I can print Whoa. hello, and it'll print hello. Whoa. But what's even better is I can print percent %p's, and I should get leaks from the actual binary itself. So I can actually leak data from the binary now. So that's really useful. That's the first step in us actually being able to build this into a workable exploit. We can get addresses out of it. One of the big things in the last video, someone asked how we would do it without the win function. Well, in the last binary, I didn't really see a good way to get a memory leak. Right. And any, any modern executable, you need a memory leak. You don't, you can't just return to some fancy place and all of a sudden have a shell. You need some way to understand where you are, what the memory looks like, what, what kind of the environment you're in. If you don't understand that, then there's no really way to know where to return to with some very small exceptions. Um, so here we have this memory leak. Uh, can I ask you, just a spitball, are there other options for memory leak other than just printf? Because I know we, whenever we see that, that's like the crown jewel, but is there anything else? So what you could do is you could have it go to, um, put s oh yeah and then if you control the pointer that's getting sent to put Puts s, will still spit, it, it that, will out spit that out but the problem being in this case we don't control the pointer that's being sent to put s mm -hmm. we control the values at that pointer right so all it would do is print the string we print we type in um, we need something that allows us to like indirectly modify it if mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. and so on that note we need to be able to first view memory and also later we need to figure out how to affect the location where we're referencing in the printf, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it might make sense in just a second. So what we can actually do here, whoops. What we can actually do here, a lot of times your first step on a printf vulnerability is to figure out how far up on the arguments you have to go to find your actual string. So we know that the string where we type quit, space, whatever, is on the stack somewhere. We just need to figure out how far up it is. So it seems a little, um, brute forcey but what i usually do is just go percent p times like 15 and then i'll just throw that at it and see if i see anything that looks like text so i'll just dump that in there whoops you should probably put the quit in front of it otherwise it's not getting sent to the right place dump that in there and we get all this shit that pops back out but right down here we see 
this that looks suspiciously like ASCII. Um, so we can actually mm. kind of, uh, we can use pwn tools again. Classic. Um, instead of just guessing at what these are and say, I want to, uh, do this. I want pack 64. We know it. And if you do that, you see that that first 64 bit number that gets printed out, not first, it's, it's way down the list, but one of these 64 bit numbers that gets printed out actually is quit followed by a null byte followed by one of our percent P's. Can you amp up the uh, oh, text sure. on that? I'm yeah, sorry. Definitely. So basically all I did is I generated 15% uh, P's and then dumped them in after the quit. So that dumps that into printf. So now we're leaking memory um, from the stack. Technically speaking, we're on an x64 system. So the first six parameters are passed in registers. After that, it's all in uh, on the stack. So technically we're leaking the first um, nine things from the stack um, as well as six of the registers um, but we see that at whatever offset this is so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen it's just fourteen which i don't think is the same yeah it is um so it's fourteen and offset fourteen or index fourteen into the uh tr format string we get our actual string itself. The reason that is useful is because we can then put an address here, if we wanted to leak memory, for example, if we put an address right here and then used something like percent %s, it would print the data at that address and we would be able to leak memory from that address. Since um, we found that on the stack. Someone had just kind of proposed, just use percent %n and then took some function from libc, like system, or just find the address of the win function in the code and use it. So we don't have a win function. Yeah, in this, in this case. case, we don't have win. Can we use system? But I don't think we can really weaponize it. So, right now. so yeah. we're, we can't yet. That's Not kind yet. of a goal down the road. Right. But in order to do that, we need to be able to leak memory. So ASLR is on, so we, can't actually, we don't actually know where system is in memory. Mm -hmm. So before we can do that, we need to be able to leak memory. Um, the system address is located in this binary once it's loaded into memory. The dynamic linker at runtime will put the address of system, which is randomized, into the memory of this process at runtime, but we need to extract that, which is the reason we're trying to leak data right now. So now that we know where our actual stuff is, we can use that to come back and create a memory leak. So like I said, if we put our an address right here at this location instead of just text, which in practice we won't be able to use this exact location because we need it to say quit. We know it has to say quit and then space. <clears throat> so really it would start here, but those first whatever, one, two, three, three bytes aren't really gonna be useful to us. Um, so we actually have to go even further. Um, so if we look here, we would probably be looking at this one or the one after that or even further down the line. What I did, another thing that Pwn Tools does really nicely, it has this thing called memleak. Um, it's a, if you're familiar with Python, it's a decorator for a function, um, which decorators allow you to do really weird things that kind of like wrap around functions and provide more functionality around a single function. You can kind of think about it as extending a class or subclassing something, but without all the work of actually setting up that whole stuff. Um, so what it does for you is basically it, you define a function that takes in one address, you leak as much information as you can from that address, and the memleak uh, module inside of Pwn Tools will actually do the work of caching memory, leaking memory around that address to try and leak out whatever you asked for. It has useful functions like extracting strings, integers, 64-bit uh, integers, 32-bit, whatever you need. So it's just kind of a wrapper that simplifies the whole process and it makes it so you only have to write one little thing that then expands out to whatever you need. Before you get too in the weeds, do you mind helping me kind of come back up to speed here? Sure. I'm yeah. trying to write it along, uh, so I'll hop to my screen. But yeah. uh, starting the process, just kind of receiving the first bend that gives us the offset that I don't, I haven't seen you use. I don't know. If that's uh, did the, you pull that from what I had? I think so. Yeah, just to help offset. So I guess I kind of. Um, I might just be old. So, so that's so that's from the old one, okay. basically okay. the same as the last example yeah. we did. And I kind of I guess you're ready to kind of blow through that. That's a fine. Bit. So I, um, I I put my key here. It's yeah. like we'd extract with string, which is cool. So I tried to do some list comprehensions to register an account, a username, and then it would XOR 
Third two along there, 64 bit of the printlf. What was the zero to four again? That's just so basically the there's bit. no bytes at the end of it. Yeah. Um, you the zero to four are the only bytes that actually have values. The other way you would do that, uh, okay. the more generic way you should probably do that is just R strip null bytes. Okay. So dot R strip with a null byte. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll strip off all of the null bytes from the end of it. Probably a safer bet. Um, I know for a fact that specific address only like I did it in kind of a non-generic way there. Okay. Um, in my example. Okay. Um, but that should work for this example. Okay. Uh, and then I'm switching the key in here and that's going through, but I'm not seeing that happen the same way that I had before. So I, the join should work, right? That sh yeah, that should be fine. So I try and run this, get some ape here. So you're here a few times. Try and help. I got a seg fault. So I will probably get a seg fault too if I run help, to be honest. Can I do just quit hello? Oh no, I, I still got help. Yeah. So quit is giving you an error as well. Yeah. Anything I kind of try and do just seems to be crapping out on me. Michael, our streams are pretty random. Yeah. What's up? Our streams are pretty random. There's no schedule. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we kind of do it when we want. When, when we have something to talk about. Yeah. That's interesting. Sometimes when we, we do it when we don't even have anything to talk about. That's true. Occasionally <laughs> that does happen. Am I, I mean, so I guess I'm just curious as to what is going wrong. But I don't know if there's any quick way to determine what to do what I have. have. So you have a similar format that I do. XRA times 32. Did you recompile the binary or are you using the exact same one? Mm, I'm using the exact same one. Maybe maybe I'm actually doing something wrong here. Because I'm working with challenge. Yep, that's right. I was just curious if you recompiled or not. No. Okay, so it shouldn't be an issue of like weird GCC moving No, symbols. no, no. Yeah. Hmm. You extracted a string at symbols key. Register Bob XOR 32. So the only difference is that I don't use that XOR function. Oh, right. You have your own custom. So, thing. yeah, I don't know. So, when I wrote this XOR function for everyone else watching, uh, there is a XOR function in Pwn Tools that is supposed to kind of like magically XOR whatever you give it together, and it makes it really nice. Um, however, I yeah. don't know if it's operating the same way. Let, let's, let's just kind of bang that out. To, uh, it's, yeah, it's super simple, not really complicated. And zip. Oh, that's what you were asking what that zip function was earlier. <laughs> yeah, I always forget the name of zip. Yeah. It's such a useful thing, but I always forget about it. Forget the name of it. C, X word with the ord of CK, and then you just return. Yep. That's a gross way to build a string, dude. Why? Pythonic, the Pythonic way to do it is to use, uh, like, append to a list and then join, because What's adding to a list is efficient? faster. They, they actually said it's really? more efficient, yeah. That's weird. That's maybe, like, maybe I'm wrong. It's like counterintuitive. I'll, I'll call this, like, XOR me, so there's not a weird namespace confusion. And... See what happens, maybe? Can you print the elf symbol's key to the screen? Yeah, I, I had a moment ago. Let's check it out. Elf symbol's key itself should just be the address and then when you take the string of it that should be the the bytes that you're pulling out yeah so let's bring this through ape now you can see that's the address in decimal in this case and that is the bytes of the key so now i'm in interactive mode i guess i can run help and it so runs that like so then so XOR quit with like some percent p yeah right to make sure it's working yep yeah, so I'll apparently go. Pwn Tools XOR is not doing the same thing that my XOR is I doing. wonder I wonder what it's doing. I think it might be something about they're trying to fit the links, whereas yeah. we know that what you're putting in is not the same length as key, yeah. but we are XORing up to the length of key. Okay. Up to, sorry, up to the That's length exactly up to right. the length of whatever you put in as much as of key. So like key is this big, we're just XORing this much of it. That's we don't exactly care about right. the rest of key. That's exactly right. Because XOR in Pwn Tools will be cyclic and repeat. So, mm -hmm. okay, I'm sorry to completely well, derail. No, no, you're fine. That's, I mean, that's a good question. Somebody else probably will would yeah, have done that. Started with since that. You asked so, the, question. the important thing to note is if you, you use erased the, your key. <laughs> Thank you. I did. <laughs> I did kill my key. Keys of the kingdom. Uh, now I want to learn all about memleek, and it sounds yeah, like so. It's... So memleek is awesome. Um, this next part kind of takes a little bit of trial and error with like a GDB, um, like a GDB scenario. So what you want to do. Basically, you're going to send, as a parameter to quit, 
a really nice extension. It's I think it's only available in GNU C, uh, libc is you can put a number followed by the dollar sign and then the format specifier and format string. Um, are we back on my screen? I'm yes, okay. yes, we're back on your screen. So that actually references the 16th argument to the printf. So instead of having to do 15% P's or something and print out all that bullshit that you don't care about, um, you could just do percent a number, dollar sign, then your format specifier, and that is the 16th one. So that's really useful. This is the thing that's actually leaking our information for us. Um, what we then have to do is put in at the address we want to leak from at the 16th argument. So that was the purpose of leaking this information, is we had to find the offset in here that would be allow us to do that. So we know that this one, which was the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15th one, we know that the 15th one is some of our percent P's. This one, uh, no, at offset 14, is exit and then 1% P, and this is the rest of the percent P's. Um, and so we want, we're, we're, we know we're basically gonna have to use the next one at 16, because this is gonna be taken up with, with this format string right here. Does that make sense? I hope I explained that, that kind that, of well. That does to me. It says like that's, the 15th index is not enough of what we need. Yeah, so the 15th index is actually gonna be this right here. And so we have to fill in this, which is three, four, five bytes, and then, and then another six, just as padding, and then we put the address, and this address will end up at the 16th parameter. The reason we have to do six here is because if we actually look at what we did earlier, this one right here at 14 is quit, followed by the space, and then percent P space, right? So that mm -hmm. means that the first three of these are in 14. This is in 15, so that's two, and then six more to fill out 15. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then this is in 16. So these padding is just to align this address into the 16th argument. So what's gonna happen is whenever printf is going to stop looking at the string after the zeros, so it's not gonna print anything else after those uh, null bytes, but the way it's reading in the string, we can still overwrite further, and we overwrite into the 16th argument on the stack, and then it takes this address, reads a string from it, and prints it to the screen. So then basically what that means is that at whatever address we give it, it will leak as many bytes as it can up to a null byte to the screen. So we're able to leak that data. Um, the way this mem leak works is the function takes in an address, we do whatever we can to leak as much data as possible, which is what we did here. Um, we did some funny little splits. I think John probably is going to hate me because he would prefer a regex. Um, I just split on the actual uh, um, prompt character because I know that like whenever you do these actual printfs, if you do like a percent %p, well, okay, sorry, quit percent %p, um, you, it's going to print out whatever you printed and then follow by the prompt character so I received until the prompt character and then split on the prompt character and took zero. <laughs> so I received until here and then took everything before it, which should be whatever we printed out. Nice. In this case, it'll be the leaked data. One important note for memleak, if you're leaking strings, always return whatever you leaked plus a null byte, because if you don't, memleak will get confused and not be able to find that null byte because it never gets returned because you're leaking strings. Um, so always, if you're leaking a string, especially with pr printf, always tack a null byte onto whatever you leaked because it, it is there and otherwise memleak has no way to find it. So this get, now we get into what makes memleak so useful. In this case, I only needed to use it once, but if you're leaking multiple things from multiple different addresses, it's incredibly useful. Um, so now it looks a little weird because we define it as a function, but in Python, this this uh, decorator allows us to have methods inside of what we defined as a function. So there's now a method called Q inside of this leak that we created, which will return a Q word or a 64-bit number from whatever address we give it. So we say, hey, I want to leak a 64-bit ad or a 64-bit number from the address of printf in the GOT. Um, for anyone not familiar. Um, 
the way that processes are linked at runtime in uh, x86 um, and probably in other processors. I know x86 and x64 better. Um, but basically, all these shared libraries, as their name implies, are shared between multiple processes. They're mapped into virtual address space in each process at different addresses for each me uh, for binary and memory. Um, and that is randomized with ASLR. So the way that the actual binaries themselves are able to call those functions and know where they are at compile time is they have a list of procedures called the procedure linkers, procedural linkage table. Oh. Um, each of those procedures just jumps to an address in the GOT with the global offset table. The GOT is an array of function pointers. Um, at compilation time, the GOT has a bunch of pointers, I think to a dummy address that just returns, I yeah. believe. Um, so. And then at runtime, the dynamic linker will go in through and change all of those GOT entries to the locations of the actual functions in memory. So in this case, reading from GOT.printf gives us the ad the actual address of printf in memory of the shared library. Um, what I've done here is I've actually before this loaded in my local libc library, again using elf and pwn tools, which is incredibly useful. <laughs> um, and since we have the address of printf, we know the offset of printf within the binary. Oh, so we cool. actually subtract the offset within the binary of printf, which we got from the libc file itself, from the leaked address we get, and that gives us the base address of, of the C library. With the base address of the C library, we can then calculate the address of literally any other function or symbol yeah, within libc. we know where we are. Um, from kind of switching gears to the, the realistic side or the, or the actual like real world side of this, if you just leaked an address, um, a printf, for example, address in memory, um, what you can actually do, um, let me see if this is going to continue running like it should. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to kill it. Yeah. Um, I wanted it to leak the address for me. Let me take out this line. So. Um, that was just an example of it running. It does work. So if you have a printf address that you've leaked, um, you can download this, this um, tool locally, but there's also an online version that I'll show you. It's super useful. Um, this is the libc yeah, database? Yeah, libc yeah. database. All right, sweet. So if you don't know what version of libc is, you can't have it locally. You can't lo load it. And every version of libc is going to be different. Um, so what you can do is the offset within libc for any given function is going to be fairly unique. It's possible some things could overlap, but in general, if it's if the offset is the same in XYZ libc, then that is the libc that they're using. So we've leaked an address to printf, and this little this is a nice little interface. There's a local version of this tool that you can download and just run it from the command line um, for ease of presentation. I'm going to use this. You just put in what what symbol that you found an address to. You can put the entire address in. Um, you really only need the first like three or four bytes, but you can put the whole thing in. Um, you can also put multiple in to kind of correlate. So one symbol with one offset might match three libc versions, but if you have three different symbols that you were able to leak, all with different offsets, that's probably only gonna match one single libc version. In our case, it's not a big deal. We can search for that. Um, well. Actually, that's a bad example. <laughs> if you did it, it would probably come up. Yeah. Um, libc database by default uh, has all of the, U a bunch of different Ubuntu versions of libc um, in there, which is really common, and a few others. I'm running Arch, by the way. I use Arch. Um, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so the libc binary weird. is not actually in the libc database, so it's not foolproof. Um, but if you can scrounge together a bunch of different copies of libc, you can usually find the right libc. If you ran it locally and then got your offset, it would probably work. So I've been printing out my base address. Oh, sorry. Um, but I think is the P interactive going to get in the way? Like when you, you when you ran this just a moment go. ago. So will it know? This mem Memleak is there now, and it should just be able to okay do the thing to mm -hmm. get what we're looking for. So it should. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Let's just check it out. Kill my terminal. Cool. Classic. CD D two. Kind of like me killing my terminal and my kernel. <laughs> So, uh -oh. okay, I guess my libc would be in a different location. Yeah, or... so what you can do... <laughs> I think it's an x86-64 X Linux GPU. Oh, probably. Libc? 
Yeah. So still loves that one. Okay, cool. You want to use stores at a different location. Yeah. So a useful thing, and what I will do in kind of my uh, my exploit scripts for any kind of like CTF or something like that. A lot of times I'll have an if statement for like remote or nice. local. And in the remote one, it'll load a, a libc that I've downloaded in the current directory. And for the local one, it'll load a libc from my local libc. That way, the exploit looks exactly the same, but it works remotely or locally depending on which libc. I've so I printed the base address, but I want to see the actual address of printf. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're going to be using up. And let's yeah, that's what you're going to use to do it. To ape again. Takes a little bit to leak it out, which I think is very cool to watch. Yep, and so if you take that address and hop over to libc database. Let's put something down here. libc database. Google will just take me there. Uh, the second one. Yep. Second one, yep. The first one is actually where you would find it to download like the, the tool you can use. So. Well, you want, yeah, that's the name it. of the symbol. Yep. Earlier you told me just use the last three, and that's So the last three or four um, yeah. is fine, but it will accept all of them. Okay. So it shows you three different versions. But you can cool. actually, and then like I said earlier, they could match multiple versions. Yeah. What you can do in this case, if you look at the first two, they actually all show ex identical op op ugh, identical offsets. If you click on them, they show you offsets to different mm -hmm. things. Um, they're all identical offsets. So if the offsets are identical, then it really doesn't matter which one you choose. The last one is a, an x86 yeah, take version. take note, 32-bit, right? So, yeah, 32-bit version. We know we're running 64-bit, so we don't want that. Um, if you if you had just done this on a remote machine and you got an address, you would you could actually click that download link and it would download that binary. You could throw it in the same folder with your local copy, and then whenever you run your remote exploit, you just load that specific libc in to get your offsets. Very um, cool. So that's that's super useful. Um, I've used it on many a challenge. Yeah, because I think oftentimes in a CTF challenge, when you're given a binary exploitation thing, they'll either they'll either give you libc or you just got to figure it out. Yeah. So. And if you don't know about the libc database or that idea of that offset on the same, then how are you supposed to figure that out? Mm -hmm. So at this point, uh, we had a comment earlier about about why don't we just return to system or something. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the goal here. Now we're we can. Of, we're pushing to try and figure out how to get the system. So at this point, we have the base address. And with the base address and the libc version, we can calculate the address of system. I print out some little, some little messages to the user just to let them know what's going on. So that now, we don't care about our printf vulnerability anymore. We know we have the address of the system, and we know how to overwrite a function pointer that allows us to control a string argument to that function. Well, if you've ever used system before, a system takes a string, which is the shell command to run. So if we do our overflow again... Oh, but now we just use system instead yep, of... Yep, so we can overwrite the quit function again Heck with yeah. the system. So here you actually see I use rstrip, the correct way to do Yeah, that. nice. Um, <laughs> So you can actually overwrite the quit function again with the system address, and here we should get presented with a shell. System address and key. I'm going to wait for you to catch up. I'm sorry. So no, I'm going to send, send this, which should overwrite it. Let's hop to me so I can see. So register should still allow us to register again. Yeah, so what we did before cool. overwrote only the quit function function pointer. It didn't okay. corrupt anything. Nice. It's just going to a different place. So now system address is what we're going to be using instead. Mm -hmm. And we actually do that. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and send quit bin sh. Because that will be calling system with that as the argument. Yep. Go interactive. Do you want me to pull the trigger or do you want to pull the trigger? You, you can do it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> interactive mode. Oh, Segmentation no! fault. Not cool. All right. So what happened? I don't know. Two sandwich bugs. Once again. Oh, so you're still using zero to four. Try the R strip. System yeah. address is maybe. Is oh, you're right. Good call. So that can be just R strip and then the null bytes that we're trying to remove. Yep. Show me the money. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. Cat that flag. Woo. Very cool, man. Yeah, so that that's it. Um, hopefully it was helpful for people. I think some really cool things that I think kind of take away is Ghidra's type system and how it interacts with the decompiler is super useful. Helps like really speed up the process of understanding a binary. Um, and then also printf vulnerabilities are, are, are fun little things. They allow you to get memory leaks and overwrites pretty quickly. Um, we didn't use a write what, what 
right what, what where, where? Um, built from a printf here but you can pretty easily um, and then also the memleak module from from pwn tools super yeah. useful so it looks like memleak just needs something that could eventually could could realistically be looped yeah so so in the background memleak will actually do it multiple times yeah if it if it tries to read in and it doesn't get the whole thing it'll try addresses nearby to try and like so say you want to leak address 5 you want to leak address 5 to 10. Mm -hmm. It leaks address 5, and it only gets 5 to 7. Memleak will be like, oh, shit, only got two bytes. Okay, well, let me try leaking address 8. And nice. it will do all that to try and, like, find the stuff for you and move around and try and figure it out for you. It's super nice for that. And I saw you use unreceive, which I'd never seen before. Will that, like, go back in time? <laughs> so like it... It doesn't actually go back in well, time. Yeah, whatever, you, whatever you give it, it will put back into the buffer the, to be returned again. The okay. only reason I did that is because um, the beginning is expecting it to be there. And right. if you don't put this here, then this will hang if it had already been read in already. Gotcha. But gotcha. I need to read it in to split off and figure out what the data is. Mm -hmm. So I just did that to make sure it doesn't hang. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sweet, man. It was really, really quick and dirty, but I think... Oh, dude. I, th I think it did a job. An hour's worth of content? I feel a little, like uh, I sped over a lot of things. Has yeah. anyone reverse engineered Ghidra itself? <laughs> well, it's a Java application, right? So uh, you can just read it. It's supposed to be released open source soon. It is Java. You can't just read it. It's going to be byte code. Um, you could decompile it possibly with Ghidra. <laughs> cool. Yeah, let's actually pitch questions that I saw there were some people spinning through. Um, someone had asked you to, like, can you rate Ghidra on a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, so I, I think it's fantastic. I don't know if I can give it a 1 to 10 rating. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, I think Ghidra is fantastic. Um, it's the best, I mean, by far the best for the price point. Um, I mean, yeah. obviously it's free. Like, can't get better you, than free? You can't, well, I mean, aside from it being free, like, those are the free options, but it's the best thing I've seen that is free. So all the other all the other free options, um, like Red Air or, well, Red Radar can do a lot of shit, so I mean, if you're really good at it, it's really helpful. But the decompilation and just the really nice interface, support for so many different architectures, we I, were, I think it's fantastic. We were playing UT CTF uh, this morning, just mm -hmm. kind of goofing around, and Caleb was running through the binary exploitation stuff. And you opened it up in Ghidra, and it gave you a full switch and case statement. Yeah, which, which just, is like, awesome. blew your mind. It's like, what? Well, because I've been using Hopper. And yeah. you, open, you open up stuff with switching case statements um, in Hopper, and <laughs> Hopper will give you, like, this weird while, like, seven while loops right, deep. Right, right. And you're like, what the hell are you doing, Hopper? And and I opened up Ghidra, and it was like, oh, yeah, switch, case, 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 default. And I'm like, this is the nicest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Would you pay for Ida at this point if you were doing x64 or x86 now that you have Ghidra? I do not know of any IDA features that I am missing. Yeah. I cannot say that I've used IDA a lot, so I've never had somewhere where some where some company has shelled up the money for me to use IDA, mm -hmm. with the exception of the little bit of time I was at the, in, the doing the things in the NSA where I was right. used Ghidra. We um, had it for some time at school, um, but we needed to set up an IDA server, and it had a floating license versus a personal license versus a computer license, and honestly, there was a lot of crappy overhead to even set it up once we had the commercial version mm -hmm. the full page and, and i never i i begged for it and then once i finally got it i never even ended up using it so uh, <laughs> that was a stupid thing but uh <laughs> Crazy uh, taxpayer dollars yeah yep i mean that's everything <laughs> uh thanks alex i love you too <laughs> and your content <laughs> so i want to change topics completely if cool we're... Are we, are we good with that? Sure, Classic. dude, yeah. We're, Classic. we're in. All right, so uh, PowerShell Troll. Oh, yes. So, Let me um, pull that up. Go on. I have it up. Switch to my screen. Uh, okay. So John showed this to... That's not my screen. That's my screen. So John showed this to me earlier, and it looked really interesting. Can you, can There's you my mouse. put you it in the, yeah, the, full, the full screen? Woo. And zoom in a bit. Yeah. Heck, yeah. All right, so PowerShell module that contains different functions that can be used for pranking this your fellow hilarious. co-workers or anyone else for that matter. So, you go through, you can grab it with an invoke rep request, import module, and you get all these things like set wallpaper, set audio control, uh, send alarm, send cat facts, send a dad <laughs> joke, send Gandalf, uh, open CD drive, 
um, send Super Mario using console beeps. Lots of little fun things. Send awesome. a Rick roll. Uh, so, John, my IP address is, uh, let's see, what is this? Oh, yeah? You're doing this for real? I mean, you're going to do it for real. We're doing oh, the live. I mean, the goal is I should not be doing it on this machine. You should be aiming it at my machine. Uh, so it looks like it's dot one dot two one five. And uh, what's, your, what's your global IP address? Uh, well, it's you can just NS look up. You know, I'm I'm, I'm, con I'm confused. What you're at to run one of these remotely, and that's where it's gonna be a little. You tricky. have to authenticate your to your machine. Yeah, so I'm gonna give you my username and password. I'm on Linux. Do you want me to? I don't. I mean, can you run it remotely? I don't know. I haven't looked into uh, that. You should be like. I wonder if you just can like install PS... PowerShell and you want to. Yeah. I have PowerShell and I want to, but can you that... like just PS exec it over or like? I don't know how uh, PS remoting will just like straight up let me into your box. I don't. Well, well you're so gonna have to... do you have WinRM on? I can turn it on if I don't. <laughs> Caleb's gonna drive again. Goodbye, everybody. It's been fun. Ah! Why can't I type? Also. I don't know if this box is domain joined, but we could also just use domain credentials. Uh, no, this one's not domain joined. This, oh. this is our malware box. Uh, computer name. What did you say the IP address was? Two fifteen, I think. One dot two fifteen. Yeah. Uh, uh services. Hash credential. Julian has come alive, everyone. You know, reversing's a little out of my element. User, go go put the user in. Oh, oh this is out of my element. Go, go put the user in and send you. Did you send me a user? He sent it on Discord, yeah. On the Discord? Not on the Discord, on our little channel thing. What do you want on? WinRM? Yeah. What's the name of that service? WinRM, I think. I don't know. <laughs> Windows Remote Management or something like that? It's what PS Remoting is. Windows Remote Management is on. Okay. I'm pulling up the credential in a window that... The world cannot see. Good. Pull it up the window they can't see. I'm, I'm again, I'm drifting away from my camera again. I do this yeah. all the time. You just want to be close to me, Caleb. I that's, know. That's all it is. I know. So I just want to snuggle up with you. No last pass. Go away. Do, 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 do. do any of the 37 people watching have any questions while John figures out what he's doing with his life? I know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know what I'm doing with this. Screen, John. Credentials. Switch to your screen, John. Well, I mean, oh, just credential. see what's red. Change, change credentials to credential. Credential. No, no, yeah, yeah, credential. Yeah, I believe so. Oh, no. Access denied. Why? <laughs> but why? <laughs> I can't pretend to know anything about this. I would just get on a Windows box and straight up run these things. I mean, we could do that, but the whole the whole point is to be able to do these remotely. So what service do we need to be able to run? Can you open up one of the things? Open, open up one of the scripts? Yes. That way we can actually read and see how it connects. Yes. I don't know if it does. I guess I just don't know. I haven't gone through it yet. So background here. Uh, we got to play CCDC, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Um, got to be kind of slipped in as volunteer red teamers, oh, and that was we might need a RPC. lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a classic red team thing. You're like, oh, dude, I wish I set up time ahead of this. I want more clean, elegant persistence methods, etc. Uh, and you'd want your baggage full of memes and artillery and trolling effects. So this is one that we share with us, and I, one of the few that I think are hilarious, and I, and I uh, will hopefully use this again. I, I don't think these are meant to connect out that way. I don't, I think, no, I don't think they're remote. Locally. Yeah, set wallpaper looks like it's running locally. Set audio it's max. send cap. Like, in these... We get to a user. Yeah. So, like, a, for like you run it from your account, as long as you have permissions to send it to the other person. So, what this does is it downloads from catfact.ninja <laughs> a fact, and then it speaks with the speech synthesizer... Did you know? So I think... Oh, hold on. So all the functions can either be copy-pasted in a PS session or import the module on the victim PC. So open up a PS session to my computer. That's what we just tried to do with That's access denied. Yeah. Oh, so what do we need? What service needs to be running for PS session? WinRM. PS session. Send uh, Gandalf. <laughs> the result you're about to find is WinRM.
Open a CD drive. Those are fun. I like the CD drive one. Super Mario. This has like the 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 tones <laughs> for <laughs> Super Mario. Hard coded in. <laughs> Wait, I wonder if I can just play that one on my computer locally. I mean, yeah, you on anything running Windows should be able to should be able to run these. So the normal thing that fucks up with PS Session is your machine. It's kind of like the uh, the known hosts file. Yeah. It will refuse to add something to the known. There's no option. It'll just be like, oh yeah, add it to the known host. You have to like manually add an IP address to the equivalent of known hosts for mm-hmm. enter P- for the PS sessions. Um, that's usually the thing that fucks up. But I don't know how to set that in your Ubuntu copy of right. PowerShell. PowerShell and Ubuntu. It's like cool. I want to do all these sweet sweet things that I would normally do with PowerShell. Except those are normally Windows. It all has to do with the register. Rooted. Yeah, yeah. What? So like, okay. What the fuck? Does Everything's that mean? shot. Yeah. What does it mean in this context? Where am I in the universe? Everywhere. <laughs> P.S. Troll. I didn't realize how many comments were in this file. Yeah, you did, you did some good inline documentation, dude. Hi, I'm from Indonesia. Awesome, dude. I'm glad you're coming to hang out. Thanks for watching the stuff. It's a long way. How, 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 many, how many miles is that? Send text. Super. How many miles is Indonesia? Indonesia? How many miles is Indonesia? Like wide? <laughs> yeah, or like tall. Like tall? Depth? Depth, height, width? Where do you stop measuring the depth? I don't think is I have it a the bucket. center of the earth? Or do you measure all the way to the other side? Good morning. Good morning, Nick. How's it going? I, I don't think I have a buzzer tone on my computer. Oh, God. Can you set your wallpaper? Or open and close your CD drive, Rapid Fire? I don't have a CD drive. Well. Sounds like you're pretty secure over there. <laughs> Locked out. I might be able to send Gandalf. Send production. <laughs> How about send text Gandalf? What does that do? Do we know what it does? It should oh. just pulse Gandalf out. So, do you mind running those on the screen that's visible to the people? <laughs> See, that would have been perfect. <laughs> I, I will, ah, how do I get it off the screen? You don't, dude. You just ran some post-exploitation framework on yourself. You're boned. Uh... Okay, I need to clone this package. And then open this package. <laughs> Give me a minute. One moment. I ran this thing called a PowerShell troll, and now it won't leave my screen. <laughs> uh, um, I'll uh, talk about some of the other fun things while Julian put, puts his training wheels on. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's uh, you're doing more than I am right here. I don't run Windows. What are, what else What else is going on? Uh, Evil SH. I wanted to share because some of these that were SH. that were shared. This this is actually so some a uh, Linux script to do some of those annoying uh, red team annoying post exploitation troll stuff. So oh, this one's really evil. yeah. This is twisted. It has some settings. You can either be annoying, insane, destructive, devastating, or unusable. And then some of the things that will happen will be like totally remove cat or in this functionality, or delete directories instead of entering them with the CD <laughs> command. <laughs> Shut down the computer instead of running a command with super user rights. Launch a fork bomb instead of clearing the screen. Have date return random dates. <laughs> have, have copy perform move instead. <laughs> Make exit open a new shell. Oh, this is so good. What is that grep doing? Which one? Add a random number to line numbers when using grep tag. <laughs> I don't think I use that all that often, but that that's that's pretty great. All too. right, ready? Julian's Switch gone. Me. Switch back to me. All right, he's ready. Woo! All right, so as you can see on my screen, uh, I'm, are you, did you switch to me? Yes, you okay. are on. So, okay, Go for no, the, the stream has the lag. Yeah, no, I forgot. There's a like a so if you import module ps troll functions dot psm one, boom, uh, run because <laughs> you know who cares about security? All right, then yeah. let's do send. You'll be the red team that's totally allowing that security action. You'll be the one actively... Send Gandalf. And it should pop open Internet Explorer. And now I'm locked out of my machine. Um, luckily, this is a virtual machine. I see a little uh, enable and don't enable down there. Yep, because that's a window Internet Explorer. I need to give this virtual machine more resources. <laughs> it's dying. Oh, no! The classic struggles what between... Working in a virtual machine. Allow everything. Internet Explorer, yeah. Just kind of, you have my machine. You have the full. full there we go. Functions. Merry Christmas. Buffering Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
He knows. He this knows. Guy gets it. He got it. <laughs> All right, now how do I kill this? Guy? <laughs> how do I? How do I stop? Him? Sweet. An hour fifteen, I think we can call that. We can that's call that a, a stream. I think that's good. Well, normally we go to like an hour and a half or an hour and two hours, but we had like, I think consistent stuff happening at every minute. So yeah, a little little uh, this could be a good video, man. I hope so. Yeah. Hello from Peru. Thanks, Jer. Hola. So people from all over. Yeah, dude. I'm grateful. You caught it right in time for us to go to bed. <laughs> uh, the stream will be up on my channel, as all of them, all the good quality ones are, anyway. Um, and you can check out some of our recent stuff where we talked about... Could you read cat facts for another 15 minutes? <laughs> I mean... No. <laughs> I can't turn that down. Cat oh, facts of ninja? Into cow sick? Cat tag, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that'd be quality. Into lol cats. Into the PT1. <laughs> where's, where's, my, where's my cat facts dot ninja? Cat. It's just cat facts dot ninja slash facts. <sighs> oh, that's what it was. Cat facts dot ninja. I thought it was. We have just a little power structure. Let's get cat facts. Search ninja. Cat fact. Only singular. What? Try without the W. Dub, dub, dub. Okay. The classic cat Slash fact. Slash fact. give you one fact. Yep, yep. I want a lot of them. Limits the length of the fact return. Limits the number of results. A hundred. Yeah. <laughs> of all the species. <laughs> I can just straight up curl this. Yeah. Oh, man. Nice. So. The cheetah is the world's fastest land mammal. Do you know the syntax for JQ? No. That'd be good, though. JFAT, JQ. Um, I think it's like dot fact. No. Okay. Let's well, do some. It probably is dot fact, but I'm gonna Google it. Yeah, let's 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 go let's get the googs. The stream has been entertaining. Thank you. Yeah, let's get a little bit more morale and just just because Hayes had a pretty on point idea. Let's get some uh, cat facts into Kause into Lolcat. <laughs> Make sure I have all these. Things. If you guys haven't seen the uh, Cyber Force video or some red team engagement stuff that I recently released the other day, I was very pleased with that. Is it just that? Just that? Uh, square braces dot facts. Vladimir is coming to save the day, I think. No. Because data. Data is what we need. It should be like dot data. Yeah, so dot data dot facts. Hmm. What is it called? What the JQ. JQ. I even have it installed. JQ access object variable names. Get key value. Oh, cool. That was easy. Yeah. How do you make curl quiet? Uh, attack S. Alex, thank you. I'm glad you watched it. Oh, yes. Okay, we need a wild one. Yeah? All right. You got this going on your box? <laughs> Can you amp that up? Like, make it bigger? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I know my vernacular is not as intelligent as... <laughs> it's not as fast as I'd like. So, you can just send control or delete to get out of this Gandalf thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ooh, wait. We could do... We could do... What could, we could... How does this work? Curl, you thinking? HTTPS, catfacts, dot ninja, slash, fact, we need a post. This is nice. <laughs> Heinz and Fernandez says, this is nice. <laughs> I'm glad we're doing some elegant, uh, intellectual, sophisticated work here. What was here. the other framework? Limit equals 100 and... Uh, let me find out for you. Limit, that's all I saw. Oh, okay. max length, max length. Oh, you don't, you don't, need it. You don't have to yeah, specify yeah. it. No, you shouldn't need it. Oh no! What, what did I do? Is that not right? I just kind of made this up. I didn't go to the website and check. <laughs> <laughs> I 
breeds. I don't want breeds. I want facts. Oh, I have to go to facts with a plural. Facts with an S. Oh no, it's still not right. I don't know what your S is doing. Do you need? Does it need to be post? Oh, does it not need to be post? I, d I didn't even check. I. Oh, I'm using post. get. So I'm using get. I'm also using accept application JSON, but. I don't think that should matter. Do you know the like loop through multiple things in JQ already? No. I is already figured that out. Is still working Eternal Blue. Depends um, on what you're on. Yeah. Are you asking is Eternal Blue still working? If you have SMBV1 enabled. Man, SMBV1. It's too uh, it's too sad. Got a comment that came through. Hexadecimal is weird stuff. Hexadecimal is weird stuff. Uh, I guess what happens if I just... <laughs> I don't... I don't... Yeah, yeah I, couldn't, I couldn't get JQ to work with the many of them. That You just did the single one and that seemed to work just fine. Yeah, so the single works, but I want this. You want this? Want what are you playing? What's your scheme? What are you thinking? JQ array. I want so you array element two. Oh, apparently there's an audio as well on this game dot thing that we didn't know. Oh yeah. Also, like all my control alt delete control shift escape, none of them are working right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why, and it's really annoying. I have to redo our machine. Do you guys teach? Uh, occasionally. Yeah. That's, oh, no. that's what yeah. I do for work. Um, uh, although I haven't taught yet, because the class is being developed, and then I'll teach in May. But um. I guess my YouTube videos and the tutorials are a little, a little teach thing, kind of, sort of, not really. What is this? <laughs> what are those? Are you <laughs> returning a zero? Well, my my box is dead. <laughs> Julian I'm is rebooting. You're crapped losing. out. Quality. Uh, I don't teach at Sans, though I would absolutely love to. Start uh, taking those guy excerpts. Yeah, I need to take some more courses and kind of be a little bit more of a squeaky wheel with them. However, I'm a young dude, so I don't think they'd really take me that seriously just now. Uh, but a couple years, maybe. Uh, what I'm working with right now is more for the military folk. Teaching teaching them, which is cool and fun. But right now, I'm just developing the course. So I would love to teach at Sands, though, if any of you guys can like squeeze me in. <laughs> Cry for help. You know John Strand. I'm very jealous. Black Hills Infosec. He does incredible work with Black Hills Infosec. Yes. Uh, I know. I think he was just leaving Sands recently, right? I thought I saw a blog post from him. Yeah, I saw um, that too. But I, he does incredible stuff, and I absolutely look up for that guy. John Strand is 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 rock solid. I need to do. I need to be better about listening to the Black Hills Infosec, um, like webcasts and stuff. The 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 shows that they do, even like in the car or like on the way to work because i've got an hour commute so i don't think there's anything wrong with me with me putting on a webcast and just listen to that very very as often as i can because they're doing some crazy cool stuff they are they're on point yeah JQ Tech M looks like it does some stuff. Limit equals 100. Uh, name. Data. Fact. Print face, not fact. There it is. I got the facts in each line. How? Um, 
Then you can use tack M and tack R. I'll swap to you. I'll swap to me, sorry. You can use tack M and tack lowercase r, specify dot data, and then I think the two braces to denote that you want multiple, like all of them as objects, and then piped into dot fact. With parentheses around dot fact. <laughs> Backslash parentheses? Yes, that's so. I need to understand and learn JQ a little bit better, but. Sorry, can you, can you hit me with that one more time? Yeah, so. Tag M, tag R, dot data, pipe to. Um, I'm using quotations in here, but backslash open parentheses dot fact, and then close parentheses. Backslash close parentheses? Uh, no backslash with a close parentheses. Right, right? Like what? Very weird. Okay, so now you've okay. got each on one line. You can do a little while read line if you want to. You've yeah, got the big whammy coming. All right. Heinzen asks, where do you start learning this stuff, man? Uh, Pico CTF. <laughs> Pico CTF's the answer to life. Right. You're right. Uh, Cybrary has some good resources to learn basic networking, basic command line fundamentals. Oh, yeah. Quality. It's not any faster, though. No, it's not. I expect it to be faster. You're just going to pull them all down and then dump them out. Mm -hmm. It's still great. It's still good, yeah. It's still, still quality. Get a help desk job. Yeah. Play CTFs, read, listen to podcasts, set up a like home lab, make stuff, break stuff. Alex, yes. <laughs> we are learning right now. Uh, and that's, that's the fun of it. So, cool. Thanks, for guys, for... Thanks for watching. Wait, we have to have some kind of really cool ending. We have to have a really cool ending again? I, like, I mean, how, how do we, how do we blow I think cat facts not enough. Yeah, really? cat facts is, is, cat is facts. top notch. Look at that cow say little cats. Oh. Oh, oh. How big can you make that terminal? Whoa. Or you can get both of them going at the same time? I, yeah. I was going to, do I have, how do you, what is a command for terminal pair? <laughs> do you have terminal pair installed? No, how do you, how It's a it? go, so it takes some time. Wow, kind of surprised Arch would have it. It's in the R. In the A-U-R. Like some nerd like us put it in there. It's a beautiful install process, though. Thank you. Yay. Yet Yay. Another, what does it stand for? Yet another I ER? Have no idea. <laughs> like, I don't know. Terminator Parrot. Terminator. <laughs> term, terminal? Terminal Parrot. Parrot, there it is. You just you just want that, and then we want this to happen again. Yep. We want... Get a couple more terminal parrots in there. That's quality. Oh, I I, I can go. I can bring this guy down, and then I can split could... two two terminal parrots. Yeah. Are they gonna oscillate? Oop, there we go. <laughs> I hope you guys had fun. Hope you had a great time. That's uh that's the only right way to end a stream. Thanks, Hayes. Bye, guys. Take it easy, everybody.